people often ask me, why do you do so many immediate implants into fresh extraction sockets? And the answer is quite simple. The answer is better outcomes. And so if we look at what happens with the traditional method, which is what we've done for, for decades, and that is we have a sick tooth and we say we need to remove the sickness. So we take the tooth out and most of the time we would graft the socket and we would let that heal. And then we would re-enter that site, let's say three to four months later, we would place an implant and then we'd let that heal. And then three to four months later, we come back and we, we place a crown on it. Now that protocol works just fine. Uh, and it works really well on the posterior, okay, where you don't have any aesthetic concerns. But in the anterior, things become a little bit different, don't they? So what happens in the anterior is when you take out a tooth and you graft the site and you let it heal, you lose bone, you lose soft tissue, you lose tissue support. And in the anterior zone, when you lose tissue support, you have an unesthetic outcome. Now in the posterior, you can manage if the papilla isn't fully, feel, uh, fully filling, uh, no one can see it. So as long as they're not getting food trapped in there, they're okay with that. But in the aesthetic zone, if you've got a blunted papilla, you got a problem, especially if they have a reasonable smile line. So if we do immediate implant placement, so in the aesthetic zone, sick tooth, it comes out, you clean out all the infection, you place an implant into that socket in the ideal location. You gap graft the gap. So fill in the gap between the implant and the, and the socket because the socket's not a cylinder. Fill that with graft material and then put a non-functional provisional on there, on that, on that implant. You're going to support not only the hard tissue, but also the soft tissue during the healing phase. We have pictures of cases that we've done where the patients come back the next day and it's almost hard to pick out the implant, which is amazing. I mean, you just think about that. I mean, they, they had a tooth taken out and they leave and they can hardly tell which tooth was taken out. That's really, really powerful. Plus, if we go back to the project timeline, now we're not waiting on a bone graft to heal for three to four months and then doing a second surgery and then letting that heal for three to four months and then placing the final restoration. Now we've got an implant that's it's in the in the socket and it's healing. Three to four months later, you're putting the final crown on there. You've developed the tissue along the way. You haven't. You don't have to do any tissue grooming because you didn't lose the tissue. So you take your final impression and you deliver your final crown, and it's beautiful. Uh, so a whole lot less project time, which is very great and convenient for the patient. It's also a wonderful thing for your practice because you're not having. Uh, follow-up visits that oftentimes there's no there's no fee for. So you're bringing a patient and you're giving them your time and services. You are using up your chair time, which would have otherwise been potentially used for something more productive. So from a project perspective, by shrinking it down, you it's a great benefit for the patient. They're into their final tooth faster, and it's a great benefit for the practice. So putting those two things together better outcomes, better for the patient in terms of timeline and number of surgeries, the number of times they might have to take post-op medication, the number of times that they get injections. All of these things add up to a patient experience. And if they have a good patient experience, then likely they're going to send more of their friends and family to you. And that's going to be good for your business because you're doing it the right way. And what we really want in the industry is we want the people that are doing things the right way to be rewarded uh, so that more people do it the right way. So a follow-up question that people often ask is what about patient selection? And that's a great question. So what it boils down to is if you are a man, you're not a candidate for immediate implant placement. Okay. <laughs> now we're just joking, but not really kind of, but not really. So what do I mean by that, you really need to assess your patient's compliance level before you start. And you can do that if you're, if you're, if you've been, uh, working with people long enough, you get a sense for whether or not they're going to be compliant when you start to talk to them. It might even be uh, part of what they do for a living, how they how they live their life, their their behaviors, their social behaviors. You kind of put together a, 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 a like a profile on the patient before you start, and you go, you know what? I get the sense that this guy is going to go out and eat a hoagie sandwich the next night, 
Yeah, he's probably not a good candidate for an immediate in the aesthetic zone. Now, we don't do any immediates in the posterior. It's completely unnecessary. So no, no I'm sorry, no immediate provisionalization, to be clear. We don't do any immediate provisionalization in the posterior. In that area, it takes too much risk. You're taking on way too much risk to put a temporary tooth in a non-aesthetic zone. It's not necessary. So take the sick tooth out, place the implant, graft it, and let it heal. Okay, with just a regular stock healing abutment, it's fine. That's what we do in the posterior. But in the aesthetic zone, we have to pick our patients carefully. And so having a good sense for whether the patient is going to be compliant with eating habits and smoking habits afterwards is really, really important. Now, if you're a dentist and you're not good at reading people, you need to rely on your team to help you. Okay, so, and you got to be honest about this because some people are really good at it and some people aren't. So when you sit down and you're sitting across from the patient and you walk out and your team member goes, I got a bad vibe on that patient. Okay, you need to listen to them. Okay, because they're probably doing better at paying attention to their nonverbals or what they say when you're not in the room to the, to the assistant that might give them an indication that uh, they're not going to be compliant. For instance, one day, uh, my assistant came to me and said, uh, patient Joe, Mr. Jones is smoking. And I said, how do you know? And she said, because the Marlboro pack fell out of his pocket when I put the chair back. <laughs> okay. So the pack of smokes literally fell out of the guy's shirt when, you know, but he had told me he wasn't smoking, but he still had the smokes in his shirt. Maybe it was just for comfort. I don't know, but we have to be careful with men because they have a tendency to be a little bit more stubborn and a little more, um, maverick like <laughs> i don't i'm trying to find the politically correct term for it but be careful with the men and and basically be very very honest with them you have to tell them if you chew on this it will fail there's no like i can chew a little bit and having had an implant placed in the last year i will tell you this after a couple of weeks i felt like i could eat on that implant I had no feeling that the implant wasn't integrated. I, there was nothing giving me any sort of discomfort or pain or warning signal, signal at all. All I knew was I had a piece of metal in the mouth that felt rock solid. So it was a great experience for me because in retrospect, I can now relate to my patients better when we say, hey, I don't want you chewing on this for three months. And at three weeks, they're going, man, that thing feels really strong. I'm going to give it a little bite here and see what happens, okay? So patient selection, really important. Anterior zone is fine if you have patient compliance. So what do we do if we don't have patient compliance? If you don't have patient compliance, you're not going to put a, a non-functional provisional on there. You're going to consider a custom healing abutment. So a custom healing abutment can accomplish about, in my opinion, about 85% of what a non-functional provisional could do. So what you would do is you take out the sick tooth, you place the implant, you place the bone graft, you put the, non, the, the healing abutment, the custom healing abutment on there, and then you have to provisionalize them. So typically in our office, that's going to be with an Essex, okay? So you give them an Essex and you say you can't chew on it, right? So that helps to have a stress break so they're not likely going to put any pressure on it. The reason why I don't feel like it works as well is that we haven't been able to design the emergence profile that goes all the way up to the interproximal contact points on a temporary, on a temporary to support the papilla as full as a non-functional provisional would. So with a, with a custom healing abutment, they stop a little short of the contact point. So you don't have a hundred percent fill of the papilla. So you're still going to have about a millimeter pullback on the mesial and distal papilla when you use a when you use a custom healing abutment. So I prefer when I can to use a non-functional provisional and then use those custom healing abutments on patients that I'm getting a sense that they're not going to be compliant. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, the Smile Engineer, helping you re-engineer your practice every day. <laughs>